And without further ado, uh, may I invite our first speaker. Our first speaker, he has a story to tell, but this story rings a bell in every one of us. What makes an art more beautiful than the art itself? He has this story, especially for us fellow Myanmar people, that resonates very deep within ourselves. A history, an art that changed the tide of war. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gon Yen Chan Aung and Pua Mien. My life is dedicated to the study of art and design and the practice of it. And I have one big question. What is it that allowed one artist to achieve astounding fame and success while other artists struggle in obscurity? Was it the creator's innate talent? Was she merely born more gifted? Was it her barami? Or was it her methodology, her know-how, techniques? and strategies that she employed. When it comes to artists, most of us tend to focus only on talent, and we tend to ignore the hard methods that she employed. There are others still who would only look for methodology and try to deny even the idea of talent. I believe methodology is essential. It is required for lasting success. However, that doesn't mean However, that doesn't mean talent is out the door. Talent has to be talked about, especially when we're starting to discuss the greatest of the great in art and design. Today, I want to practice this, I want to explore this topic with you through the life and works of Zamindaji Upose, a man lovingly dubbed the father of Burmese theater. He happens to be also my great grandfather. And we have here with us today his youngest daughter, Domin Fei. You may know her as Amy Po Fei. U Po Fei is considered to be the greatest Myanmar actor and dancer ever. In fact, no other theatrical performer from this country has been able to achieve the same level of cultural and historical impact in the world. Noel Singer, a renowned historian of Asian theater, says that he was the star who outshone all others. While many Minda of his generation enjoyed fame briefly, Po Seng was still dancing at the age of 72. And he literally danced himself to death during a performance in 1952. It's a little bit exaggerated. He didn't die on, on stage. He died at home shortly after a performance. Let's have a look at some of the methodologies that he employed. Upo Sein was born in a small village, so far away that back then it took a seven-hour boat ride from Patain. He was just a village boy named Mang Dai. And Mang Dai and his friends, they learned how to dance in the rice fields, not at a dance school. And they performed at local Shimpyu ceremonies, novation ceremony for young Buddhist boys. Now, Mang Dai wanted to go far beyond that. Everyone questioned him. His friends protested. Why would anyone come and see a show by some village boy just because he started calling himself Po Sein? Sein, by the way, means diamonds in Burmese. He gave himself the name claiming that he was worth his body weight in diamonds. But Mang Dai had what we call today a design insight, a niche, if you will. Myanmar theater back then was performed within a circle that's drawn on the ground. It's actually a lot like the stage that we're on today. There were great things about it, but the disadvantage was that 
during the raining season, which can last up to six months, no one can really perform, and the people of Myanmar had nothing to go and look at. Mandai knew that in order to draw the crowds, they didn't have to be the biggest dance company. They just had to build, fill that void. He saw the small puppet theaters called Yote, which was performed on a miniature stage. He adapted that idea, and he designed staging for the first time. One shelter for the dancers, and one shelter for the audience. What, when he did that, it changed everything. All of a sudden, for an entire raining season, the people of Myanmar had no one to go and watch but them. Just like that, simple thatched shelters were built, and suddenly a star was born, and Myanmar theater changed forever. There was also strategy to the kind of stories that he told, his product, if you will. Myanmar culture back then was deeply rooted in Buddhism, and Buddhist abbots had a profound influence on what was okay and what wasn't okay. Upo Seng himself was told by his seado that when he died, he would end up as a beta or in a year, essentially told that he'll go to hell. Dancing is not a favorable activity back then. It was frowned upon. But Upo Seng was a devout Buddhist, and he had an idea. In order to make dancing and making merit work all together, he would adapt stories from the Ngaya Ngaze Sanibado, the Buddha stories, if you will. When he did that, it did two things. First, he, he achieved endorsement from the abbots. Many of them actually started coming to his shows. Second, and this is really important, he introduced to Myanmar people something they already loved and respected, but he delivered it in a different way. Experts of hit making and experts in design, such as Raymond Lowy and Derek Thompson, calls this a familiar surprise. It's a DNA found in every great hit, be it an object, a story, a song, or a film. You see, every single one of us, we're both neophobic and neolithic at the same time. What that means is we love things that feel new, but at the same time, we're very afraid of things that feel too new. Every hit in history tend to manage these two emotions in perfect balance. Uposei also knew that your product is nothing if you can't get it to people. So he came up with what you might call a distribution strategy. St. Mahadevan, at its height, commissioned two sets of staging, two sets of costume, and two sets of everything. Here you might see the image of the elaborate sets that he designed. First thing I want to point out to you is that Although this is far more complex, he's still sticking to the two-stage system that he designed. The umbrella-like structure was for the audience, and the rectangular structure was for the performers. He used warehouses all over Myanmar, and because he had two sets of construction, he would, set the, he would start begin building the construction in the next town while they were still performing in the first. This made sure that he, he, we, he was able to perform shows at a ferocious pace that was unmatched. Historians conclude that because of that system, the Burmese back then were exposed to more live theater than anyone else in the world. Now, these are all his methods. These are things that you can go home and implement into your business today. That is what a methodology is. So it's time I introduce you to one of his talents, his uncanny ability in casting. The story goes that one evening, the dance group was arguing regarding who should be the king in the next play. Upo Singh's oldest son was arguing that Po Singh should be king. After all, he's the star, and they're called Singh Mahanabe. That's when Upo Singh walked in and said that neither Po Singh or any other Singh is by default king. The story is king. Making story king means that it begins by putting the right person in the right role. He knew this, and he was so committed to it that he would do it even if it meant he had to play the villain or he had to forego the acting role altogether. He had an extraordinary talent and courage when it comes to putting the right person in the right role. Now, 
this talent of his will get tested. In 1941, Japan invaded Myanmar. The first part of the attack was swift and deadly. Jiang Gong fell in one day. The Pusing family had to escape to Dedie. As the fighting continued, so did stories of unspeakable wartime atrocities, including mass rape, murder, and torture. You have to understand that Japanese soldiers at the time, many of them were also teenagers. They too were inflicted by war. They suddenly found themselves in a very toxic environment, and they were acting it out and coping with it in equally poisonous ways. The colonel leading the Japanese army, you might know him as Bo Mojo, knew this. So when he came across Upo Sein, he asked Upo Sein to organize a show for 2,000 troops in Yang Gong's famed Palladium Hall. Upo Sein was restless. He began pacing up and down his rehearsal hall. What are the risks of things going wrong? What if they don't like the show? I mean, what do you do when you put on a show for an audience who's not really known for being the most forgiving? That's when Nim Nye and her little brother, they were 10 and 11 at the time, came marching into the room. Nim Nye has learned a song at school. It's a song from Japan, a children's song, and she sang it for Upo Sein. Upo Sein asked Nim Nye what the song meant, and he knew then exactly what to do. The night of the opening show came. The soldiers took their and Upo Sein came onto the stage. He did his famous clap. Gentlemen, my little son and daughter would like to sing a song for you. And just like that, Mimi and her little brother came marching onto the stage. The children began to clap and sing. No instruments. After the first few verses, the curtains dropped from behind the children and revealed a full group of dancers and a full Burmese orchestra. I'd like, to, to, I'd like you to use your imagination for a minute. It would have looked really similar to this. There would have been two people in the front, no instruments, and behind them would have been a whole dance group. As the children finished the song, the dancers danced and the orchestra played. When the song was over, there was complete silence in the theater. And then a sniffle, and then a sob. The audience was crying. Then came the applause. It almost never ended, while Mimi and her brother bowed helplessly on stage. It was an ovation, a historic ovation, one recorded in books about war and books about theater. This brings me to my conclusion. Is it talent or is it methodology? I believe it's methodology. I think methodology is something that gets you to a certain point, a point where no one's been to before. But when you get to that point, it comes back to talent, because talent is what allows you to trust your intuition and follow through with ideas that are seemingly crazy. In the life of Upo Sein, it was methodology that got him out of a village and into the spotlight but it was his talent that made this story happen. Once upon a time in Myanmar, a little girl and a boy sang a song, and maybe it was just for one night, but it disarmed an army. Ladies and gentlemen, here to sing the chorus of that song from that very night, my grandmother, the last remaining child of Zamindai Upo Sein, Nimye Sein. Got it? Got it. Right. Okay. Katana, Katawana? Katawa お国のためにお国のためにたたかったへたいさんよありがとうへたいさんよありがとうへたいさんよありがとう。Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you.